I, I want to begin the reflection on addiction by um, understanding from the standpoint of the 12 step recovery program for addiction, what the turning point is in the life of the addict. And, and the turning point is the point at which they hit bottom. And they it hit bottom is for them a crisis in which they're able to see for themselves the bankruptcy of their strategies that they don't really have a problem, that they can handle it, that they can get out of it, it isn't, and they just see that's completely false. And they're able to see for themselves that this addictive use of the substance they're addicted to is destroying them. And they can also see that they're powerless to stop. So the crisis is for them kind of an existential crisis. That is, if this is up to them, they're finished. They're finished. So if they don't resort back to denial, they're only faced with despair, if it's up to them, unless there's another way, unless there's another way. And the other way is that maybe it isn't ultimately up to them at all, that maybe there's a power greater than themselves that can achieve in them the freedom from the addiction that they, by, them, by their own powers, are powerless to achieve. That's the other way. And so the very beginning then is a kind of a faith. And really the faith is freedom from the addiction of the perception of oneself as absolutely isolated, all on one's own, having to make it on one's own terms. And this faith kind of begins to break open that addiction to this radically different way of experiencing themselves. That I'm in a relationship with a mystery greater than myself, and that the mystery greater than myself is in a relationship with me. And my hope lies in that relationship. And th this relationship with the mystery greater than myself, in order, to be, in order for it to be actualized, I have to hand my life over to the care of that higher power. I can't have it both ways. I can't say theoretically there is this presence, but I'm still gonna to try to make it. I have to hand my life over to the care of the higher power who can achieve in me what I can't achieve. And so this starts them on this path. They concretize that through a fearless inventory, through the making of amends. This concretized in the faith community of recovery that they bear witness that this is real. They move through it. It gravitates toward the 11th step of increasing conscious contact with God. And in that process, the person says to their higher powers, they go through this painful, messy process. They say to their higher power, I don't know who you are, but I do know who you are. You're the one who saved my life. And I don't know who I am. I do know you're the one I saved. And so there's this intimate radicalization of how one experiences one's life and brings one to this new state of consciousness for which one is immensely grateful and wants to pass it on to others. So we might say that's the first level of what we could think of as the spirituality of, of freedom from addiction, the healing. The next level is, or this gets generalized in terms of how we heal from the long-term internalized effects of trauma and abandonment. So if, for example, if in my childhood, God forbid, if I was incested, if I was repeatedly beaten, if I was painfully abandoned, I was, placed in this, I was placed in this really unbearable situation that the very persons on whom I depended to survive were the very people who were destroying me. And therefore, in order to survive it, I had to somehow disconnect from the truth of what was happening because I couldn't bear it. And so it's because I disconnected from the truth that I live. And that might have been true when you were a child. But the trouble is they get stuck in it. So because I disconnect from the truth of my life, I live. If, if I, when I was being incest or beaten, I was passive. Because if I would have spoke up, it would have been worse. I can say to myself, because I was passive, I lived. But then the person says, no, because I am passive, I live. 
because I'm af I'm I'm afraid to I'm afraid to step forward on my own behalf. I offer external compliance so as not to be attacked or abandoned. And this survive this this survival strategy formed in trauma. I'm addicted. I'm addictively bonded to it. Because even though I can tell, I find it embarrassing, I find it difficult. When I try to break it, I have strong physiological reactions. And it preempts my ability to step forward. Can I be vulnerable and safe at the same time? Or because I got angry, I live. No, because I am angry, I live. A lot of people in prison are stuck in that one because they acted out. <clears throat> because I use food in a certain way, or I use sexuality in a certain way. Or when I got older, I compensated for my inadequacies by, by, by achieving things, like image over identity, I live. No, because I choose image over identity, I live, and I can't stop. The bankruptcy is I can see it's not working, and I can't stop. So one reaches out for help. At a certain level, one reaches out for help concretizing a person who's there for us, in, in whose presence we can openly be this way, who sees through it and sees in us, something of value we can't yet see. Little by little, we can see it. But when we turn to faith as a resource, this is the essence of our faith, really, is the essence of our faith. Is that in our faith, we could say, and for us as Christians in Jesus, we can say that the, the deepest question of my life, really, is not what my father thought of me, or my mother thought of me, or, my, or what my husband or wife thinks of me, or what my pastor or my boss thinks of me. Really, the deepest issue isn't who I th what I think of me. <clears throat> but can I join God in knowing who God knows me to be? Can I join God in seeing who God sees me to be when God sees me? This is salvation. And in order to do this, in order to do this, I have to let go of my own present way of seeing things. And I discover I can't. We're afraid to lose the control that we think that we have over the life that we think that we're living. And we're addicted to what binds us. See? So out of the depths I cry unto thee, O Lord. This is the cry for salvation. See, can I walk on water? See, can I, is this possible that I could place my life over into your hands? And, uh, and so then the mystery of the cross, then there's this mystery of this being liberated from this deep addiction to the, to the illusion of an ultimately isolated self that has to make it on its own. To realize I'm in the presence of the love that loves us and takes us to itself. And uh, through, that, through that inner process of discipleship, whatever we want to call it, we can come to apatheia, to this true sobriety, this deep sobriety, the peace of God that surpasses understanding. And so this would be one way then of understanding the spiritual dimensions of the a process of being freed from addiction, from self-destructive internalized patterns to open us up to this relationship. And I like to apply this to the living school because I think what's unique about us, it, all the above applies, whatever addiction there might be, whatever trauma there might be, certainly it applies to discipleship to faith. It's a Christian faith community, it applies. But what distinguishes the living school, it seems to me, is how does all this look from the standpoint of the mystics? Well, how, what contribution do the mystics make? See, if we turn to the mystics for guidance with respect to these dynamics, what kind of, di what kind of guidance do the mystics give? And that's what I'd like to focus on here. I'd like to look at this in a very practical way, something I've been aware of, is that, you know, there's these regular phone calls with the students where Richard, Cynthia, and I, they ask questions. <laughs> And um, when I listen to the questions, what's so great about these questions, to my mind, is that they're path questions. They're the kind of questions that people ask who are on the path. What about this? What about that? What about this? <laughs> Which is great. <laughs> it's just really great. People not on the path don't ask questions like that. So the gift is the very fact that we will ask the question. And a lot of them are people on the path of meditation practice. So I commit myself to a practice, and in the practice, questions arise. What do I do when this happens? What do I do when that happens? How do I know this is real? How do I know I'm not deceiving myself? 
How do I get past this? How do I carry this into the workplace? How do I carry this now? All these questions, questions, questions. And they're very important. And notice when the teacher responds, whichever teacher it is, they always respond in the same way. Always. <laughs> One, they respond out of their own experience because it's not a theory. The, the theory of healing heals nobody. <laughs> it's, it's not conjecture. They, they bear witness to how they experience it. And also, what's real important in their answers is the teachers aren't freelancing. They're not making it up. They refer to a text. That is, they refer to the lineage. They, they refer to the timeless lineage of saints and mystics down through the ages one and to the heart of Jesus many whole nights in prayer. See? And they speak out of that. Uh, see. And so it's in the light of that then, I'd like to share something about mystical sobriety relative to these questions. And I'd like to just think out loud for a minute, things that help me as I listen to this. See, uh, Thomas Merton, there's a lovely quote in Thomas Merton, Palace of Nowhere, it's in there, page 14, I think I can remember. He has this lovely thing, he says, you know, he said, God, my God, with you it is always the same thing, always the same question that nobody knows how to answer. He said, I prayed to you in the nighttime with, night, with, 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 with desire. I have prayed to you in the daytime with light and with desire, and you have descended upon me with great gentleness in this inexplicable night, dispersing light, defeating all desire. And so Merton suggests that we go along, eventually we start to realize that really God's the one asking the question, not us. And that we don't know the answer to God's question. Furthermore, we don't even understand the question. And so I think what mystical sobriety is, is I'll put it this way to me. Here I'll do this thing where, like, where I'll be God talking. What have you got to Listening to all this, I take it to God and pouring out my heart. I'll be God talking. You know, I'm listening to you and uh, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I, I would agree with you that you are a confused person. I would agree with you. And I can, I can see one impasse after another. You know what? I get the feeling that once one of the teachers gives you an answer to this question, there's going to be another question. <laughs> if you notice, there is no end to these questions that you're asking. Have you ever noticed that? Therefore, I, I have a question for you. I have a question for you, really. What is it in the light of which all these questions and all possible questions are rendered in some essential sense irrelevant? That's my question. See, what is it in the light of which all these questions are relevant? And what it is, is that I'm in love with you. I'm so in love with you that I'm utterly giving myself away as invincibly precious in my eyes in the midst of the unresolved matters of your heart. I find in these unresolved matters no obstacle to how infinitely precious you are to me as I pour out and give myself to you as life of my life, life of my life. And my hope for you, my hope for you, here's the mystics. You would take this whole process, sensing how true this is, in the cloud of annoying, you'd place it in the cloud of beneath the place all the questions underneath in the cloud of forgetting. And St. John of the Cross, you would realize that I'm drawing you to myself by, in a passage through a dark night, the unraveling of all possible questions and answers. For Meister Eckhart, you would enter into a virgin mind. See, I'm not having closure in any possible conclusion of any kind about yourself, others, the earth, or God. For Teresa of Avila, you realize the time has come to love more and think less. And you sit in a deep quiet in which this love is translating you into God. And that you would, that you would give yourself over see, to, that, to, that, to that process. And um, when you realize that all this sounds quite beautiful, but you don't know how to do it, raising a new question. And then I would say, that's the point. 
why don't you surrender yourself over to me in your inability to even know how to begin to do the one thing alone that will give you the deliverance you've been longing for all this time? See? And why don't you sit in your powerlessness, in my presence, breath by breath? And therefore, I think, therefore, these methods of contemplative prayer are all our strategies to keep us poised at the brink of what we're powerless to attain is attaining us and our inability to attain it. And here's where I'll end with this prayer, which I would put as a way, as a path to mystical sobriety. Is that you're sitting here with God in this way, sensitive to this question. And uh, you're sitting there with God, with, with God in the midst of this question. And you, you listen to God when you inhale, this is the, the I love you prayer. So that when you inhale, you breathe in God, loving you through and through and through and through and through, unresolved questions and all. And when you exhale, exhale yourself, like give yourself in love, unanswered questions and all, to the God that's being given to you unanswered, unanswered questions to all. For in the reciprocity of love, your destiny is fulfilled. And that way, all you discover the unsubstantiality of all possible questions, which is the, the peace of God, which is the gift of tears, which is experiential salvation, which is the endless homecoming, is the way. I think that's the thing. This doesn't mean, then, that we stop asking these questions. But it means the questions themselves take on a new meaning. Because each question is as poised one more time you know, to sit at the edge, uh, uh, being taken to God in the midst of the unanswered thing. And I, I so that's my, that's my thought. And then I would call that mystical sobriety. See? I, I would call that freedom from the addiction, where the asking self remains our base of operations. So somehow, if only I could check off all the lists, and get on answer to all these questions, the buzzer would go off and I'd win. See that I, I would get like really? Do you really think do you really think that you're going what you're looking at? You can't stop asking. But but we can reflect on the nature of our questions in a new it's like what am I really looking for? And do all these questions beg the question? All these questions beg the question. And therefore, each mystic then offers their own metaphor for this, entering into the dark night and the fourth mansion, uh, virgin mind. They're all metaphors for this very thing I'm talking about. So that when it becomes habituated, I would call that a state of mystical sobriety. And then we would look lastly and see that we're all caught up in the same thing. We're all caught up in the same thing. And uh, therefore, can I be with people in such a way that I'm safe enough to be with, that they can let me know the hurting edges of unresolved things? And they can tell I can see in them a preciousness or a value that's not threatened or compromised by their troubles. And can they then begin to internalize that and take it to heart and use it as a grounding place that they can find their way out of this and then pass it on to others? So that's my meditation. Thank you, Jim. That was that was so beautiful and helpful. Um, something that struck me that I just wanted to relay to see if it's if it's helpful or not was um, when you were talking about the way that the, the lineage is there as a as a support in a way. And one of the ways it came to mind for me was almost as different love letters from mystics, like an example of their long love affair with with God or the mystery. And they're like, here's how it looked like in my relationship. Though it's not my own personal relationship with, with God or mystery, there's these beautiful love letters of the struggle, the strife, the darkness. Um, but it, it, it gives a way for it to be a support, almost like an older couple who, who, who have walked a long path of long partnership and the ups and downs. You can look at, at Eckhart and say, oh, okay, that's how Eckhart was participating that it can give me a, a, a set of eyes to approach my own relationship with integrity and um, trust in the in my own experience uh, does that make sense it does I mean and I mean, refine I, I very much so 
Because this then raises the question, well, how do we read the myth? If the mystics are telling us this, how can we read them in such a way that we can recognize this and what they're telling me? Does that make sense in a way? And what I, what I think it is really for me, or what it has been for me, is that what, you read the mystic in such a way that they, they say something that's so eloquently beautiful it breaks your heart. And you can tell, even why in the midst of not being able to comprehend it, your heart recognizes it. And that the, the person is speaking out of the depth of the truth of themselves. See, they're saying, let me share with you what happened to me. Let me share with you what happened to me. And let me offer some guidelines of vulnerability so that what happened to me might happen to you. And so that, that, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the tonal quality that resonates in the mystic. You know what I mean? Well, that's the thing. I think you're exactly right. So they're like, you can call them older brothers and sisters on the path. Or you can call them people that kind of bring forward uh, th this process for us. So I think that what the mystics do then is one, they bear witness to it by how beautiful it is. And secondly, they offer guidance in it. They, 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 they bear witness to it as unexplainably beautiful, intimately realized. And then they offer guidance in how to habitually ground ourselves in this beauty this thing and, and how to recognize the cul-de-sacs and stuck places along the way. And, and all that. I think you're right. I would say that. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I'm thinking about shame and how shame often hijacks the intimacy of uh, mystical sobriety and is such an experience for uh, for people who are in addiction or you know the the nine year person sober who falls off the wagon you know um, and, and then I'm also thinking of the ways to which we're all addicted um, and 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 so I wonder if you could speak about how shame hijacks that intimacy and what to and what what to do when that happens yes. Yeah, that's very good, yes. Because let's face it, see, we're right, right at the edge of spiritual direction. And we're right at the edge of where when we hear talk like this, it's beautiful. But when I come up against where this meets me in my efforts to find it, I touch things like shame. So here, here, here'd be one way I'd respond to that. You know, in AA, they talk about uh, making a fearless inventory. And it raises the question, a fearless inventory raises the question of what a fearful inventory is. And a fearful inventory is you already learned enough bad news about yourself. You don't know if you can stand it anymore. You're like, I don't know what else is back there, but really my plate's full. I'm an asshole, I get it. You know, you really, I'm going down, the, I'm going down the tubes here. You don't need to like push this point home beyond the point. I'm kind of trying to hold myself together. But it breaks the question. What is the destructive power of the shaming truth about ourselves? It's believing that, that, the, that the broken thing about us has the power to name who we are. So what is shame? So how do we understand shame in a way? It's, it's, it's a kind of a faith that our, the brokenness that we have. By the way, it's, it completely lacks any tenderness because very often we began drinking to numb a pain we couldn't bear. So the very way we were using to take the edge off the pain was the very thing that made the pain worse. And then we attack ourselves for that. It's like, it's like unrelenting. There's an unrelenting punitive voice inside of us. But what, what is the power of AA, really? What is the power of alcoholics? A person stands up in a room full of people and tells their story of, of, of the wreckage of the past. And instead of being attacked or shamed, you can feel in the room like the communal safety that holds the person in the self-disclosure, because they've been there too. It's like a room full of broken whole people. Like this. Some people said, I feel safer at a recovery meeting than I do in church. And that's faith in the higher power. So, but what if the brokenness has no authority at all over us? What if only love has the authority over us? And that's the essence of the gospel. See, the essence of the gospel. Is that, this is why I say the miracle stories of Jesus 
when you really look at the healing stories, they're all the same, basically. A person brings suffering. Jesus listens to the suffering, responds to the suffering, but Jesus sees the essence of their suffering. is isn't that their daughter died or they can't see or they can't walk, or they're a prostitute or a tax collector. The issue of their suffering is they think they are what's wrong with them. You say idolatry of their shame. And reflected in his eyes, they see their true face before they were born, hidden with Christ and God forever. And that's experiential salvation. It's experiential salvation. So this is the good news of Jesus Christ. It, it, and so shame, and a certain level of shame is kind of healthy. It's like a conscience. But where it becomes toxic is where it becomes identity which closes off experiential access to how unexplainably we, precious we are in the midst of the broken thing. And so I would answer that way. But it's very hard to, to see how, how, as I say, what therapy is about too, is how, how can I, or, or can I find someone with whom it's safe to share what hurts the most, knowing they will not invade me or abandon me. And by doing so, they can teach me not to invade or abandon myself. This is the long road out of the dark places. So that's a big question is shame. It erases the whole question about what feeds the shame. Yeah. Does that make sense in a way to see it that way? Yes, it does. That's so helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah well, Jim, thank you so much for your, your time today. This is, it's just so rich. Mark and I were just saying what a privilege it is just to be a part of these conversations. It's, oh, me too. And, and, and again, this is what blesses me about the living school. You know I mean, I mean uh, what an amazing event this is, really, the living school. You know I mean, really, it's a kind of contemplative Christianity, reborn in the world. Yeah. And, and what I'm saying is, is that the, 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 the collective journey with each other mm. is we're bearing witness to this, that we might then take it out into the world. Mm. It's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, yeah. Over and over again. <laughs> really? Yeah.